Hi, I'm Peter, Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Richard D. Ray's Furniture Wood Digest Editorials. Again, this is the, this is the second half of Sook Family Memories Collection, or ZFMC, number 24. And uh, Richard Ray was my father's brother. Furniture Wood Digest, February 1987. Editorial comment. Some thoughts on design. Several times in the last few months, I've heard some pretty strong criticism of the furniture industry. It didn't all come from the same person, and it wasn't all leveled at the same thing, but much of it was. The critical comments were mostly about the lack of true innovation in furniture design in this country. One person, a furniture designer himself, said there hasn't been a new furniture design trend in the U.S. for more than a decade. Everything is a copy of something else, or a rehash of something that's been around a long time. The introductions at last October's market illustrate the point. There were some additions to existing lines, some shifts in color treatments, and some fabric changes in upholstered, but there was little excitingly new and different. Just more of what we already have. Some ma furniture manufacturers realize their designs are too static, so they go searching elsewhere for new ideas. The elsewhere picked by most of them is in Europe, at the Milan and Cologne Furniture Fairs. Americans somehow feel that Europe is where the action in design is coming from, and the only way to get an original thought in design is to get it from Europe. When they do, of course, the design is no longer original, but just another copy. Part of the reason for our lack of design creativity is the good old boy attitude that permeates our conservative industry. As a group, furniture manufacturers represent one of the last great strongholds of male chauvinism in America. Almost all of the top management jobs and positions of influence are held by men, and this includes designers. Women, because they find acceptance difficult in our industry, do not even try for the top jobs. <clears throat> the few who do succeed usually make it through an interior design school. It seems to me that since we are in dire need of some fresh new ideas in design, and since women are the ones who actually buy most of the furniture in the first place, we should make it easier for women to enter the industry as professional designers. <clears throat> they would bring an entirely different perspective on how to approach furniture design, both from a functional and aesthetic viewpoint. Women's orientation to real consumer needs and wishes could very well point us in exciting new design directions. Their innovative input could prove to be the way out of today's trendless ship drifting. Admittedly, this cannot happen overnight. It will take time. But other industries across the country have opened management doors of opportunity to women, and the industries are reaping benefits from the inflow of talent. It's time we started opening some doors in the furniture industry, too. Richard D. Ray. Furniture Wood Digest, July 1987, editorial comment. Kill all the lawyers. Or kill all the lawyers? The economic health of American business is a complex subject, and one of the negative forces affecting that health is the product liability problem we have in our industry. The problem is getting worse, not better. It has been written about in numerous newspaper and magazine articles and been the subject of several TV news programs. But despite all the publicity, no solution is yet in sight. The number of product liability lawsuits in our court system keeps growing because the necessary federal legislation to keep it in check has never been enacted by Congress. If we look back in history, we find William Shakespeare unwittingly hit on the answer 400 years ago when he had an actor in one of his plays say, The first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. That solution might be a little harsh in today's world, but it can be easily argued that the U.S. does have a surplus of lawyers. Too many of them are adding to their livelihood by going after lucrative court awards made possible by our present laws and a jury system that tends to be sympathetic to any injured party, regardless of cause. In the furniture industry, product liability is wreaking financial havoc on the makers of woodworking machinery. Their resources continue to be drained by the huge increases in the cost of liability insurance and outrageous court awards against them. 
Some companies have been unable to buy liability insurance at any price and are running bare. Others are just closing their doors or filing for bankruptcy reorganization. Hardest hit among machine makers are some of the oldest and most reliable names in the industry. They're the family-run businesses with a history of making good machines that last a long time. Some of their machines made 50 years ago are still operating today, adding to the company's liability exposure. What makes the liability pill so hard to swallow is that when an injury occurs, it virtually, it virtually never is the fault of the machine. It always is a matter of negligence, either on the part of the operator or some other worker. Injured workers are prohibited by law from suing their employers, so the lawyers go after the machine manufacturers instead. Since machine people cannot take Shakespeare's solution seriously, what can they do to curb lawyers driving toward more and more litigation? The answer is to put new pressure on Congress to enact a uniform product liability law. The the machine makers can't do this alone. There are not enough of them. They need the support of furniture manufacturers, so I urge you to write your congressman and tell him that you want a product liability law passed this year that will, quote, hold, hold manufacturers liable only when their conduct is unreasonable. Consider whether plaintiffs were responsible for their injuries. Eliminate capricious litigation and limit damage awards. Establish a reasonable statute of limitations. Develop clear guidelines on product warnings. Your letters will not only contribute to solving the product liability problem, they will help open doors to needed new designs in American woodworking machines. Machine makers today are afraid to experiment with new products but it, because it increases their exposure <coughs> to liability lawsuits. But if that threat can be brought under control by federal law, machine makers can devote their energies to innovative product development instead of spending their time preparing for more liability litigation. How about writing your congressman today? Richard D. Ray. Furniture Wood Digest, April 1988. Editorial Comment. Two Sides of Management. It's easy for a person running a woodworking company to get so wrapped up in the mechanical side of the business that the human side is ignored. When a management management cry goes out that more production and higher quality are needed, the solution too often is focused on bringing in faster machines and high-tech equipment to get the job done. The truth of the matter is that new machines and computers and manufacturing systems are only part of what is needed. The woodworking industry still is one of the most labor-intensive industries in America. And whatever advances in technology are made, it still takes people to make things happen. Failure to remember this simple fact can spell big trouble at companies where management is afflicted with tunnel vision and sees only one side of the total manufacturing picture. The unhappy result can be the opposite of the anticipated product output. It can also open the door to an unwelcome approach of union organizers. This was the central idea presented by Mildred Ramsey, the kickoff speaker at a meeting of the American Furniture Manufacturers Association, the AFMA, a few weeks ago in Charlestown, South Carolina. Ramsey was a factory worker for 42 years at a major textile concern before she discovered people liked what she had to say, so she started public speaking. She is credited with single-handedly leading her company's response in successfully warding off a union drive to organize the workers. Ramsey told her audience she was going to talk plain, and she did. No flowery language and no complicated theories. She has a no-nonsense worker's view of management, and she tells it like it is. She said too many managers are trying to get a positive result using a negative approach, and it just doesn't work. She gave new meaning to some old truths about how to work with people. She said employees are not personnel, they are persons. They respond to courtesy and they respond to recognition. When they're not given recognition and not treated courteously, they feel shut out and hostility sets in. Ramsey said the top managers of a company really are not important to the workers on the shop floor. To a floor worker, his or her first-line supervisor is the most important manager. In the eyes of a worker, the first-line supervisor is the company. To illustrate her point, Ramsey told how one of her sons became ill some years back, 
so she phoned her supervisor that she had to stay home and care for him. The supervisor said, Certainly, Mildred, take all the time you need. Which of your boys is it, Tom or Steve? Talk, talk about recognition, Ramsey explained to her AFMA audience. That supervisor not only recognized me when I called, he knew the names of both my sons. When I got back on the job, I never worked so hard in my life to do a better job for that supervisor. What managers need to put on their shop floor, as she went on, is more courtesy, concern, and compassion. Supervisors need to speak to each worker, and they, and they need to smile when they voice their name. There needs to be some human kindness, too. Employees need to be listened to. They need to feel like they belong. This is the way to build enthusiastic employee loyalty and a more productive workforce. Richard D. Ray Furniture Wood Digest, May 1988. Editorial comment. Make yourself heard. One thing that happens every presidential election year is the federal legislative process grinds to a near stop while the campaigning goes on. But there's still plenty going on in Washington, and it's laying the groundwork for a whole new cycle in the way the government operates. The Ronald Reagan administration's de-emphasis of big government and his policies of deregulation are in serious jeopardy. The liberal Democratic leaders have the whip hand in Congress, and they are coming up with a new agenda of legislative reform that pack a lot of public appeal. It almost looks like a blueprint for economic security and health benefits and a cleaner environment for everyone. Among the proposals that will impact the woodworking industry are ones concerned with parental leave, minimum wage, high-risk occupational disease notification, wood dust, formaldehyde, product liability, plant closings, clean air, and more health benefits. The staggering cost of complying with these and similar proposals would, of course, be added to the American cost of doing business. Manufacturers would be forced to pass the costs on to consumers in the form of higher prices, thereby defeating the competitive position in the world economy we are just beginning to regain. As one example among many, consider S-79, the High-Risk Occupational Disease Notification Bill. It would require employers to, to, no, to notify all present and past employees of any workplace risks to which they may have been exposed during the course of their employment. In the woodworking industry, this would require employers to send notices to all employees for the past 30 years that they might get nasal cancer from exposure to wood dust and formaldehyde. Not only would this open the door to a flood of liability claims against employers, it would force them to assume the medical costs of treating and monitoring all employees so notified. The irony of all the legislative activity going on in Washington <clears throat> is that various bills being proposed in Congress have less to do with real issues stated in the bills than with a bid for political power by the proponents of the bills. Furthermore, even though the pr proposals sound good, many would actually hurt the people they are supposed to help. Minimum wage, for instance, would hurt low-income workers by limiting entry-level job opportunities. Now, it's one thing for me to express my viewpoint on this page. It's quite another for some constructive action to come out of it. Anyone who happens to agree that some restraint needs to be placed on the new federal legislative agenda easily can voice their opinion where it will count the most. There's nothing to it. Just pick a legislative proposal on which you believe the congressional breaks should be applied. Then pick up your telephone and dial 202-224-3121. This is the Capitol Hill operator in Washington who will connect you directly with your senator's office. You may not wind up talking to your senator, but at least you, you will be talking to someone on his staff, and your opinion will be heard and counted. Richard D. Ray Furniture Wood Digest, October 1988, Editorial Comment Getting Back to Management Basics Impart, Imports are no longer the number one worry of the American woodworking industry. A lower dollar has mostly taken care of that headache. A bigger concern now is people, how to get them and how to keep them. There is as much competition for the available labor supply that, that questions about personnel practices have assumed a new importance. How can qualified employees be found? What is the best way to train them into skilled and productive workers? 
How can their confidence and respect for management be developed so company loyalty follows? The furniture industry is not alone in trying to come up with the best answers. Questions like these are much on the minds of plant managers and owners in all industries. So much so that there is a whole new crop of management textbooks and seminars aimed at coping with the human resources dilemma. The central idea that many of them proclaim is that the way to run a business is through psychological motivation of employees. They say the secret of successful management is through understanding and satisfying the psychological needs of workers. They say this is the way to create job satisfaction and inspire workers to greater effort and thereby increase productivity. But this really is no different from what psychologists have been preaching to business managers for the past quarter century. And the record shows the psychologists have been hugely successful in convincing business managers to adopt their ways. Psychological management systems have become rampant in American business, but the predicted results somehow have not materialized. We seem to be falling behind, not just with our overseas competitors, but with our own earlier records. Productivity growth, instead of increasing, actually has been declining in some areas. Clearly something is wrong, and much of the blame is in the mistaken belief many business managers hold that psychological handling of employees is the way to run a business. Too much reliance on that approach wastes time in doing such things as management by objective, formal appraisal systems, and job descriptions. Some so-called job enrichment programs and participatory management plans are in fact counterproductive because they split a business apart. People and departments go off in all directions with no purposeful or unified objective. Instead of entangling themselves in a lot of fancy psychological systems, managers today ought to get on with what management is all about. Managing work, establishing priorities, determining strategies and allocating resources of people, machines, materials, methods, and money. But to do this effectively requires strong leadership and the exercise of authority. The furniture industry is full of examples that support this view. How many companies have been founded, grown, and become great successes because of the strong leadership, determination, and authority exercised by the owner-manager? There have been many, and there could have been a lot more if the psychologist hadn't gotten into the act. Richard D. Ray. Now, we have two comments from the original publication, and the first is from John S. Ray, my father, quote, Outstanding. Thanks so much for gathering up and printing Brother Dick's editorials. I really enjoyed them. They are filled with good common sense, which has very broad application, not only to the furniture-making industry, but any business or office and life in general. Thank you, Dick, for writing these excellent editorials and permitting Peter to reprint them. The picture of Dick on the cover is the best one I have ever seen of him. John S. Ray, Rocky River, Ohio. And now there's a comment from Alice G. Ray, my wife. I read this CFMC with great interest. Actually, my father was the very first one to read this issue. After reading it, this is what he told me. Alicia, some of these articles here are just right for you. You read them very well, so you would know how to deal with the teachers and staff of Restless Educational Center. Alice Garcia, Nire, Quezon City, Philippines. So that concludes today's topic. Richard D. Ray's Furniture Wood Digest Editorials, 1987 to 1988. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, good luck to you with your efforts in family history, if this in- interests you. Finding, preserving, and sharing old letters, diaries, photographs, and other printed matter. And, and interviewing elderly relatives while they're alive. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.